So welcome to another episode of Ask the Growbot. Um, I'm Jesse Porter, the Director of Content at GrowGlide, joined as usual by Will Gonzalez, the Director of Marketing and Creative Tech. And also we have the luxury this episode of being joined by Gretchen, let me mess it up, Kim Molfenig. You got it, yeah. Oh man, I struggle with that so much that I just like, just call her Gretchen, don't screw it up, don't embarrass yourself. Um, no. But Gretchen's from ERI, so uh, Energy Resources Integration. And full disclosure, I've known Gretchen for a few years here. Uh, we worked together on a number of different content creation pieces from best practices guides on controls and HVAC. Uh, we co-authored an IPM, Integrated Pest Management, um, article that brought in environmental itineraries and sort of dove into the impact of conditions on applications and pests and pathogens. Um, and we've done a couple of webinars together. and. Um, one thing I'll say about Gretchen is that, A, I always recognize you from a mile away across the room at these cannabis conventions and look forward to picking your brain and talking to you about what's new and fresh. But you always bring this substance to these conversations where it's not just an opinion or a theory, it's science and engineering background applied with business acumen to these CEA cultivation facilities that I genuinely think help people make more informed decisions. And personally speaking, as a cannabis cultivator for my career, you've really gotten me to think a little bit differently about the metrics that I collect and value. Specifically, ones that you've brought to my attention have been like grams per watt yield equations and waste per pound equations that have really helped me refine my business acumen when I talk to people about cannabis cultivation. Um, but that said, I'd love to toss it back to you and let you do a little personal intro so people know who you are. Thanks so much, Jesse. Uh, yeah, it's been a real pleasure to work with you in this growing industry for the past few years and educate the market, uh, learn from growers and share stories of success so that others can be resilient and profitable while also being efficient and stewards of the environment in their community. So um, like Jesse said, I'm Gretchen Schimmelfennig. I'm a senior energy engineer at ERI, and I've chosen to really specialize in the controlled environment agriculture industry to bring the lessons I've learned about efficiency and decarbonization and sustainability to this industry as it's a really energy intensive one and, and needs support because it feeds our communities. It supports lots of different um, types of jobs from food to ornamentals to cannabis, greenhouses and indoor farms. So um, the firm that I work with is based in San Francisco, California. We've been around since 2011 and we specialize in industrial and agricultural operations. And so we've been helping growers get rebates for many years in California, but we also work directly consulting with growers to help them access other types of funding stacks like REAP funding if they're non-cannabis as well as helping growers like cannabis producers look at existing facilities and do energy audits and commission new designs and renovations, um, keep, keep tabs on energy codes and uh, specific requirements for cannabis compliance and help growers comply with those benchmarking requirements and audits and um, taking advantage of efficiency programs. So I'm here in Vermont and I am excited with our market opening up this past year. I'll be at NECAN this weekend and um, am excited to see New York come online and other states. So I really think that this is a, a cool time to ask uh, the Growbot what to do with certain cannabis scenarios that are unfolding in states like uh, the West and, and out here in the East. So thanks for bringing me on today. Thanks Gretchen. It's our pleasure. I think there's a ton of different things that we can unpack here. As you know, I'm very excited to, to have you on as a resource. And I think it's um, a little bit of an unutilized tool and resource that you guys provide. Sometimes I talk to cultivators don't even realize how to take advantage of it. So hopefully we can make that clear to some people um, along the way. But I think one thing I'd like to start with is a term that I heard recently and, and you guys throw it around too, which is energy engineering. Uh, maybe we can ask the Growbot, what is energy engineering in cannabis CEA and why is it important? And just sort of see what it has to say. This should be fun. <laughs> I, I explain Let's what see. an energy engineer is pretty often. Mm -hmm, here we go. It's important for several reasons. Energy efficiency. Okay. Number mm -hmm. one. 
sustainability, one of the buzzwords. What does it mean to you? Energy, water, waste, lots of sustainability definitions, but um, mm -hmm. you can see here that it's talking about greenhouse gas emissions, which has been a real direction that my industry has been going in, focusing on the carbon. Yeah, and for me, the thing that jumps out is obviously cost savings, right? Like the EBITDA, the profitability, the operational efficiency of your facility is oftentimes so dependent on <laughs> A, how you make those informed decisions early on on energy efficiency, and then how you go about thinking about them once you're operating your facility and what investments you make to reduce them. Um, but I also heard you mention, you know, regu regulatory compliance. I think that's an interesting one to unpack as you see more and more changes in the industry and regulations. Maybe you could speak to that a little bit, because I think that's something that people don't even think about. Energy compliance, like, why does that matter? What's that, you know? Yeah, and it's only um, currently in statute in some states. So some growers may not have to deal with it, but if they decide to be a multi-state operator or, you know, the federal laws change and the walls come down, uh, we'll maybe see national regulatory uh requirements for environmental compliance. So in certain states, uh, you can take a look at Massachusetts, uh, Illinois, Vermont, New York, they all have cannabis control boards or regulators that have made specific energy standards. They have in some cases required a certain efficient lighting product, perhaps a certain PPE, uh, photo, photon efficacy, or they're in Illinois saying, oh, you've got to use a certain type of HVAC system. Um, in Vermont, they learned from California Title 24, which is a crop agnostic regulation that is the energy code for the whole state for greenhouses and indoor farms of all types. And that's caused the other states to then add um, more regulations for themselves on things like greenhouse envelope. And then states like Vermont and New York have said, you know, you've got a benchmark every year, just like Massachusetts and we want you to have energy audits. We want you to um, to go above and beyond and show your environmental performance, maybe get recognized. So some of these states are setting up these compliance mechanisms so that they can also create recognition programs, certification programs. So I like to talk about, you know, compete and comply. So go beyond compliance so that you can be competitive. Um, I appreciate that it talked about cost savings because with the increase in energy prices, even if compliance is requiring you to do something, it really behooves you to do it anyway, because it's going to hopefully make your OPEX lower, even if the CAPEX of the equipment was a little higher. Um, yeah, I think the cost of producing a pound of cannabis is a critical component in the cannabis industry of whether or not you become a distressed asset in three years or whether or not you have the capital to create a competitive brand. Um, something. something that's interesting to me when I think about energy efficiency, right, as a buzzword or a topic is the challenges of measuring it. And I think that's something that your team does really well at ERI is helping people make a more informed decision on what is energy efficiency from a mechanical solution that you choose in your facility. How do you measure it right now from a cost analysis? And then how do you measure it for years to come over the life of ownership? And I think you're probably uniquely positioned to speak a little bit about that and, and the challenges. I know coming from an HVAC background, it's like, oh man, how do we really determine what's efficient and what's not? And how do we fairly assess that over the course of five, 10 years? You know? Yeah, you touched on some really uh, important challenges that I deal with on a weekly basis, which is... Um, You've got to monitor things so that you can measure them and then you can make informed changes. Um, energy efficiency for cannabis producers has for me been an, a tandem exploration of energy productivity. Um, oftentimes the utility bill doesn't tell the whole story. Uh, I need to know how many grams are coming out of that facility for the harvest for the year. And then I've been including in my audit products a story of your energy productivity. So are you getting a good amount of cannabis for the electricity you're using or are you kind of below average and there's some changes you could make to improve productivity? Um, the environmental impact of these facilities is not always the key focus, though it may be part of their brand. So I think that focusing on energy productivity in complement to energy efficiency is important. You mentioned though, how do you monitor it? <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So a lot of growers are looking at monthly utility bills and seeing the entire month and all of the equipment added together. So you can't really tell, well, how much is my lighting contributing to that? How much is my HVAC? 
we know from research that lighting is probably contributing about 40% of your energy or more, and HVAC is contributing about 30% or more, and then there might be some other stuff like processing loads and other types of things involved, ancillary stuff like drying, but submetering is key. And a lot of growers are installing very sophisticated monitoring systems to capture information about CO2 and temperature and relative humidity. But then when you look on the dashboard, there's no information about energy. So I encourage growers while they, while they are thinking about automating and monitoring, why not add energy into the mix so that you can understand the value of, oh, I changed my set points. I ended up using less energy. Cool. I actually know the correlation between those two things because I have the data. That's, that's a great point. And I think maybe, Will, we could ask another question real quick here that might explore some of the things to consider when we're thinking about overall energy efficiency and what we can manipulate and change is maybe the importance of envelope integrity in mm -hmm. cannabis CEA. Um, something that I think about a lot is, you know, the tightness of the envelope, the building that we build, the insulation. Um, just, I'm curious what the Growbot has to say about this because I know you and I discussed this, just whether or not the room's sealed, the concrete floors being covered with epoxy or not, and moisture migration, heat loss, insulation, all these things factor into the overall energy efficiency, if you will. And I'd love to hear your perspective on that because I know um, there's a number of different ways to build a facility and we're all familiar uh, with groups out there that are doing it really well and driving this industry forward. Mm -hmm. um, but again, there's no real baseline. Well, what is the thickness of an insulated panel? Do we even need insulated panels? Like what's, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I went ahead and just asked it for the top five. Top mm -hmm. five factors in that topic. See what it comes back then. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing up uh, air sealing. That's something that I've been seeing uh, investigated more. I even saw some pictures on LinkedIn of someone doing a blower door test on a grow room um, because I don't think growers are cognizant of how that really impacts the effectiveness of the dehumidification systems, the cooling systems. Um, a unrelated story from my past is I, I worked with a music store and they were in a very leaky old building and they were trying to humidify. And I was like looking up the specs of the humidifier the humidifier and it said that it's half as effective when you're dealing with a leaky building. So if you think about that in the converse, like you could need twice as much capacity to satisfy a leaky grow room. Um, so uh, energy yeah, efficiency, I'm glad to see that as topic number five. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's funny because, you know, when, when I would size and spec out a, a HVAC for cannabis cultivation facilities, I would always ask about the flooring and people were like, why is that important to you? And I'm like, well, if you have an unsealed concrete floor, we're going to have all this moisture migration into the space, which I've learned through experience now means that we have a different latent load calculation, a different performance need, and maybe we should size to that unless you plan on allocating resources to seal the floor. Um, it's an yeah. interesting conversation, you know, and it, then go ahead. That, that comes up in cold storage, like a walk-in, you know, if, if you only insulate five sides, you're only insulating you know, five sixths of the envelope. So yeah, it's mm -hmm. uh, an architect that I work with would agree. It's like a box has six sides. You should treat all of them as important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it also speaks to pressurization, right? I mean, as a historic cultivator before I transitioned to commercial, it was all about negative pressure, right? I wanted to suck everything into the room so odors didn't escape. Number four, odor control, which shouldn't be that big of a deal in commercial. You should be thinking about it. But realistically, I was just trying to draw everything through a filter and have it escape through one point. Whereas now positive pressure is probably a more, um, you know, sanitary solution in that you prevent press from coming in, that when those doors open, air blows out versus being sucked in. And it gives you a better range of control when we really think about the pressurization of the space itself. But again, I've been in a number of facilities where you try to do a pressurization test. And again, it doesn't seem like there's an agreed upon baseline definition for how to apply that to cannabis CEA, um, where you just have like one part of the room has a certain pressure and another part of the room has another pressure it becomes this whole challenge when we think about uh, air balancing and things of that nature in the space. Yeah, I think that um, while cannabis is unique, we can still apply building science tools like blower door tests to these facilities. We can take differential pressure measurements. We can 
encourage growers to install sensors in their rooms so that they can be getting that information on a, a routine basis. Um, one thing that I didn't see it add on here for the envelope is uh, the reflectivity and the ability to clean it. <laughs> um, you know, those yeah, are some yeah. aspects to think about too that impact the effectiveness of your lighting, impact, um, you know, pathogens and um, potentially the ability to get certified for good manufacturing practices and so on, you know, food safety certifications. Yeah, and to speak to number three, pests and pathogens, right? I worked in a facility in Colorado that I consulted on that had been battling root aphids for three years and they had done everything and sprayed everything and played this whole game. And at some point, uh, one of my visits there, I said, I'm gonna leave the facility and walk the external parameter. And what I realized is that their walls were relatively porous and they had tons of plant material outside that was covered in root aphids. And that was the entry point yep. for these pests. And as soon as we applied the appropriate IPM outside, cleaned that up and had the employees understand what it meant to not track them inside, they got them below an economic threshold that was no longer a threat to their financial stability in the space. And just like something as simple as patching that hole mm -hmm. And, and dealing with the external pressure as well um, from that envelope al allowed them to sort of understand IPM on a different level, not mm -hmm. just spray and pray, but instead mm -hmm. understand how to control the environment. You know? Yeah, that reminds me of a story from an architect that I was that I work with, um, Anderson Porter Design, and they were talking about how important it is for openings, making sure that you're not just thinking about the envelope as just this one you know, contiguous sheet, it has openings. And so what are you doing at those openings to seal and per make sure that you're not gonna have heat transfer, you're not gonna have moisture transfer, you're not gonna have pests or anything being able to get through. So yeah, this is a good answer. Um, we just know more, of course. <laughs> I think that's, that's, that's what we always idea. found is that, yeah, the grow bottle get us to some good jumping off points, but maybe he, here's even another follow-up question to this that you could ask Will is, uh, um, the importance of commissioning and retro commissioning when it comes to cannabis facility build outs and design. Mm -hmm. Gretchen, I know you know this well, right? We design these facilities, everything seems great on paper. We go through the process of building them. Sometimes we commission them at build and then we say, great, thumbs up, good to go. Air's balanced, room sealed, let's rock and roll. And then six months in, we wonder why we're not meeting those set points. We don't have the adherence we expected. And all of a sudden we realize through retro commissioning that there was a flaw or something is out of whack or something is no longer performing the way it was. And to me, that was a huge thing that I never really considered as a legacy grower, right? It was shit's always going to fail. So just when it fails, fix it. This is a more of how do we set up you know, SOPs for truly monitoring and adhering to these set points. And I think you've talked about this uh, in some very sophisticated ways that I appreciate of really understanding how to assess what you've built and understand how to fix it through the quote unquote commissioning or retro commissioning process. Uh, yeah, I think it's citing me here right now. Um, so I think a key aspect of this answer is that it's describing both energy and non-energy benefits of commissioning and retro commissioning. So what matters to the business and then what matters to the maybe the bottom line in the environment. So uh, commissioning new construction facilities or, or major renovations, you can look at a lot of things and catch them before bigger, more expensive changes or mistakes are made. And so things like being able to achieve the environmental parameters that you have as your goals. Will your system actually meet that? Will it meet that at the worst possible conditions? Will it meet it during emergency scenarios? Um, what happens when systems shut down unexpectedly or if controls, you know, uh, the power goes out? So testing those scenarios is a really important aspect of commissioning. And then when looking back at existing facilities, we're able to check out are those systems that were maybe intended to supply this amount of capacity still doing so? Uh, are the controls that used to have a sequence of operations that was you know, designed to achieve these SOPs still the same? <laughs> has, it, has it gone into manual? Has someone shut something off? Has, has uh, some you know, different uh, personnel changed? So there's actually no knowledge of what that original SOP was. So um, optimizing systems so they perform as they were supposed to and understanding like 
what maybe capital costs might need to be invested to replace physical equipment, or hopefully maybe there are some low cost, no cost options, like changing some things in the controls with just you know half an hour on the computer to update some things that can happen. Um, but sometimes it might be that, oh, we've got to install a three-way valve here, or maybe we need to uh, replace this controller. Those are some things that might be uncovered during these studies. And the last thing I'll mention is that many utilities offer funding for these studies, uh, especially existing buildings. So I recently wrote an article in Cannabis Science and Technology that's going to be in the next issue. Um, and also, I think Resource Innovation Institute just wrote an article about this too, talking about the value of these activities because utilities will partially fund them. So if you are thinking about getting a study because you're not meeting your KPIs, maybe you can get half of that study funded. So then if you choose to implement the recommendations, you might even get more money from the utility if it saves energy. This episode is brought to you by White Paper Wednesdays. Do you have an insatiable hunger for cannabis cultivation knowledge? Does the why of an SOP matter just as much to you as the how? Do you read scientific white papers on cannabis research for fun? Well then, White Paper Wednesdays was made for you. Check out the bi-weekly White Paper Wednesday blog at growglide.com, LinkedIn, or on Instagram to talk the talk, walk the walk, and make more informed decisions about cannabis cultivation. One thing I wanted to point out is I think that commissioning is almost like a misnomer in this industry that we think you commission something once or you retro commission something one time. And what I really learned about living with HVAC and living in a cannabis cultivation facility for multiple years is that constant commissioning is the name of the game. Um, you know, the idea of being a master grower on your resume isn't nearly as useful as someone that can analyze and operate a system within the expected parameters. And when it falls out of the expected parameters, what do you do to fix it? Like you said, you can address it and maybe you need a capital investment to solve a problem. Or maybe the reason your HVAC is not performing as expected is the last cultivator that came through decided that the Sunu set point should be 70 degrees Fahrenheit and 40% RH, which that machine was never built to achieve and won't achieve. So it will never do that, right? So understanding how to continually assess the mechanical solutions in your space, their performance, their expected performance, and what you can do to change. I mean, sometimes it's as simple as a change in SOPs to still achieve the results that you hope for without a big investment. But I think something, one of the, you know, one of the main reasons I really wanted to have you on here, and maybe that's the next question we should ask, Will, is, you know, what, what incentives and rebates are available to cannabis cultivation facilities? And um, obviously this is something that we talk about a lot. I talk about with my customers, but I don't see enough people really going through the process to get incentivized to get rebates and to chase this money down. And I realize that it's not always free money that you need to maybe invest a little bit in studies and research and things like that, which I've seen RII do as well, if not better than anyone in the space to really make sure that we're getting the most available funding possible. Um, but it's also that peace of mind of knowing that when you're gonna spend money on a facility or spend money on a retrofit, that you're spending good money to future-proof your facility, another buzzword, but allowing you to be competitive in the long term. And hopefully you can talk us through a little bit of what the ERI process looks like or what your process looks like to guide people from a greenfield or a retrofit design perspective to take advantage uh, of what capital's available. Yeah, I, I appreciate this question and I'm excited to see what the Growbot has to say. Um, I like that you mentioned continuous commissioning and monitoring based commissioning is also a term to use. And that goes back to the access of data. So by continuing to look at outputs from maybe energy monitoring systems, you can then choose to continuously make updates and improvements each year. Um, and so this kind of links to the incentive world the more data you have access to, the more incentives you can potentially take advantage of. So if you're beginning a cannabis business, you have some plans to build a new facility, you can take advantage of new construction programs. And so new construction programs are often designed to 
have a holistic look at your entire design, take a look at any applicable energy codes and make a baseline model and then compare that to your design. And all of that modeling is generally funded by the utility. You're going to be able to have a utility do technical assistance to tell you, oh, hey, if you choose this efficient lighting product, you could save this much energy. If you choose this efficient HVAC product, you can get additional incentives for that. I will say that HVAC systems can have a harder time getting incentives. The lighting world has been very lucrative for incentives because they use so much energy because they're on for so long and they're very high wattage, even when they're LED. So- And easy to measure, right? Yeah. Sorry again? And easy to measure, right? Compared to like the pretty modulating simple, yeah. components of an HVAC. Yeah, and... an indoor grow is pretty easy to model for lighting because you have a simple number of hours that that lighting fixture's on, whereas HVAC modulates and you are basically going to have to model all of the temperatures and humidities based off of what the grow says that they want to keep the room at. It's very complex and I do that stuff. And I know that basically it, there's less money on the table because in some cases, going back to that regulations to thought that we were talking about, in some cases, the states have specified a pretty high efficiency rating for HVAC equipment already. So you might get more money for standalone dehumidifiers than you will for an integrated HVAC unit because they haven't created efficiency ratings specific to HVAC equipment yet. So that's getting really nerdy and in the details, but my, I'm hoping that there's a future where CEA HVAC equipment has its own efficiency rating and you can start to see how those systems really perform for indoor growing. Um, the greenhouse world has some good incentives as well. I'll mention, you know, greenhouses can get incentives for things like greenhouse curtains, controls. Um, they might get incentives for IR film. So they kind of have some interesting options um, that the indoor grows might not have availability for. Um, mm -hmm. And then I'll just mention that until cannabis becomes uh, a crop that the federal government supports, the USDA doesn't have opportunities for cannabis growers to get um, support, but maybe someday they will be able to because there are federal programs for efficiency funding as well. So I just hope that uh, it says here federal, and I just wanted to mention it's mm -hmm. probably going to be hard, but there are tax yeah. um, experts. There are accountants in the cannabis space that can help you maximize tax credits that still you can get even as a cannabis cultivator. Yeah. That's great. I appreciate you sharing that information. I think number one seems pretty straightforward to most cultivators, right? Uh, energy efficient rebates, choose more energy efficient tools to cultivate with, whether it's LED, choose more efficient fans. In the end, it'll cost you less energy to produce every gram, which will be more valuable. Mm -hmm. The demand and response programs, I think is clear to every grower that transitioned from legacy. It's much more complicated than this, but something as simple as I'm going to run my lights at an off peak time yeah. and it will cost me less to produce cannabis. Have you heard about the California um, summer reliability program or market access programs? That's essentially what they, the state did is they created a specific program for incentives based off of when you're saving the energy, not just the energy you're saving. So I've been helping a lot of cannabis cultivators take advantage of that program in California. I hope that there's more programs like that. Um, demand response isn't always the solution for growers, but shifting load off of peak hours is definitely feasible, especially if you have a, some flower rooms that you can move up or move you know, down away from those peak hours. Um, there's also an interesting program in um, Colorado that kind of is like a custom incentive. There's lots of custom incentive programs. Basically bring in some technology, tell the utility how it saves energy, and they'll try and give you money for it. Um, but there's this program in Colorado called CROP. It's like Cannabis Resource Optimization Program. And it basically gives you a energy manager and they help you like, like we were talking about, do continuous energy management and it's all free. So I hope that more states do that. It's funded by their energy office. I really think that states with large cannabis industries should be like really throwing more than just incentives for equipment, you know? Yeah, and the support to make those decisions along the way are so critical. Yeah. Number three jumps out to me a little bit, the renewable energy incentives, mm -hmm. right? As you know, my mom was hippy dippy, line up the chakras, you know, we're going to have solar panels on our house kind of person. So that's something that immediately is like, yeah, that's what we should do. The more I dove into that in facility design, I ran into a lot of challenges and you've probably seen this too. And I just love to get your perspective on this, right? Mm -hmm. I've seen 
different uh, energy sources in different geographical locations. For example, I've seen people in Santa Barbara say, I'm going to bring in these giant wind turbines to build my facility because it's going to be somehow more efficient. But sometimes you run into this, oh my God, the CapEx is so much. Or another example was a facility I worked with in Oklahoma that's like, I'm going to power my whole facility off of solar. And they realized they had to buy acres and acres of yeah. land next to so them to put out a solar array in okay. order to support that. I'm curious your take on that. I mean, I, I want more renewable resources and I want diversity of resources. Is that a good play? Is that smart for the long, long term? I see efficiency, decarbonization and renewable energy as friends and they can all be in your strategy mix. Um, renewable energy may not be as important of a strategy or as cheap of a strategy as efficiency, right? The energy you don't use is cheaper than making energy with a solar panel. <laughs> but um, sometimes there's no less there's no less energy you can use. You've got to make some. But so I was doing an energy audit with a grower and they wanted to consider, well, what if we wanted to offset our energy using solar? And this is a craft facility with less than 3,000 square foot of canopy and they needed three and a half acres to cover their um, their energy bill because cannabis uses a lot of energy. So if you think about it, like a commercial office building can get away with having a solar panel on their roof and it'll take care of the building, but that's because the energy of that office building per roof square footage is, is enough when we don't have cannabis facilities that are big enough with big enough roofs to take mm -hmm. care of that. So I, I tried to say in, in there that I was like, you know, do you really want to take down three and a half acres of forest to do that like yeah. that's probably not your most resilient and sustainable choice there's probably other things you can do like find better power to purchase or um, just be more efficient and use less energy or uh, consider doing decarbonization and, and figuring ways to like have less emissions total rather than focusing on it being renewable but uh, it can be a story for some growers I know some growers have made it part of their brand so it can you know it can be something that you choose to do if it's really, that's the lever you want to pull. And those geographical considerations can be powerful, right? If you're building a facility in Nevada, maybe solar is a great option, or maybe there's a place where geothermal comes into play, or who knows what you can tap into, but geographically, yeah. I think it's I know a, a grower who has biomass <laughs> because she has sustainably forested wood. Like it, renewable means lots of things for different people. And depending on how dirty your grid is, maybe it makes more sense to do to do renewable energy. But if you have a pretty clean grid, there can be other things you might need to consider doing. Yeah. Speaking of things can mean a lot of different things to different people. I'm going to put you on the spot here. Maybe this is when we can ask the robot too, is I'm curious you personally, because I know I have my take on it too, but what do you think is the most important metric or KPI when you come to measuring energy efficiency. I always think about operational efficiency. That's sort of like where my mind starts, but I'm curious, is there a metric or a KPI that jumps out to you where you're like, this really sings? And again, I might've baited this earlier with a grams per watt was an eye opener to me and a new way to measure efficiency and understanding waste per pound is not something I ever considered before and mm -hmm. went from being a cost to a benefit to a tool I could utilize for renewable soil or whatnot. Mm -hmm. I'm interested to see what the Growbot says. Resource efficiency per yield, grams per kilowatt hour. Yep. Like I mentioned earlier and grams per liter of water. Um, yep. And those things are important. One thing I, I took when I was with RII, I took power score to translate grams per kilowatt hour and then also grams per BTU of other non-electric fuels and translated that to what I feel is my most important KPI, which is kilograms of CO2 equivalents to kilograms of or grams of weed. So translate that energy. Is it dirty energy? Is it clean? If I'm in Massachusetts and I use, you know, 200 kWh per gram and versus I'm in, you know, Arkansas and I use 200 kWh per gram, those are going to be different and they might even have different costs associated with them too. So translating from energy to energy costs, as well as from energy to emissions are the two things I would do with that, that grams per kWh KPI, which I think is the energy productivity KPI that I was describing, or you can call it water productivity. And then if 
you were talking about waste, you can call it waste productivity, right? Like how much, you know, tons or pounds of waste am I generating per gram of cannabis or vice versa? Um, and then with water and waste, you can create circular mm -hmm. KPIs. So how much water am I recirculating, recapturing, reusing so that I eventually get to a zero grams per liter? I'm not, or, you know, or zero liters per gram, right? I'm not using any water to make it because I have got a circular system. Same thing with waste. If I'm regenerative, I'm completely uh, circular. I've gotten down to zero grams of waste per gram of, of cannabis. If we get right. to net zero carbon cannabis, which I really hope we do someday, you'd have like zero kilograms of CO2 per gram of cannabis. Yeah, and I think there's like a snapshot in time and then an assessment over the length of ownership of time that are both important. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I think about that is I think about purchasing distressed assets and how I assess those assets. It's again, sort of a, a murky waters when people think about allocating resources to take a facility, but it is, it's more than just EBITDA to me. It's really understanding these energy efficiency metrics and saying, is there something here that I can invest in that I can correct to make myself more profitable? Or is this something that I'll have to throw so much capital at to solve the problem where there's maybe not a solution in play that it makes it a bad investment? Even though it might have a more beneficial EBITDA or higher profit margin right now, uh, five years from now, this might be a really bad money pit. Yeah, yeah. So trends of these KPIs are actually what's important. The snapshot of one year or maybe your design phase KPI comparing design to actual, that's the important story. I love that this Grobot is like giving my job away. Um, <laughs> so. Yeah, so I asked a follow up question. So like, what's a realistic <laughs> number for these KPIs for both grants per kilowatt hour and energy? Quiet Grobot, don't energy. tell them. <laughs> so what do you think, Gretchen? Are these kind of like in the ballpark? Yeah, the energy efficiency one is spot on. Like I've been talking with Mike Sartarian, a fellow engineer in the space about what is the lowest feasible, like lowest possible electric KPI you could get to, i.e. like all you're doing is lighting the plants. You're not even giving them any air. You're not even cooling, you know? And that's like one, one gram per kWh. And that's based off an assumption of, you know, something like, you know, 60 grams per square foot you've got to put that as an input as well what is your production per square foot how much energy are you using and you can get to that number and mm -hmm. um yeah if you're getting above two you're you're not you're worse than average if you're below um 1.5 or what if you're below two you're you're better than average so i think that yeah the the energy efficiency one is good i haven't been doing water as much i uh I wrote the cannabis water report when I was with RII, but I don't think we did it in grams per liter. But I would say that if it got the energy one right, I imagine it got the water one right too. <laughs> um, yeah. but, and this yeah. one's this is always tricky to me too, because I know it's like looking through the, the interwebs to try and collect all this information. And I know years ago when we first started talking, there weren't a lot of good data points. I mean, you and I were putting slides together and citing four or five, 10 facilities that we talk to no. as a piece of information that we can try and build off of. And I know there's more information out there now and it's coming forward, but that always scares me, right? Is like, what information is granular and accurate? What information is caged? What information should we really be utilizing to make better decisions for this industry moving forward? It's something I always struggle with, you know, when my buddy tells me one thing and over here, I see 20 opinions this way, and then maybe some outliers, like maybe the outlier is actually the most accurate one. I always struggle with that. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, the the data transparency of this market continues to be pretty opaque. And that's why regulations requiring benchmarking are a, in some ways a benefit to us all because it creates transparency of like what are regional averages, what are indoor greenhouse averages, You'll see the academic community has started to research more, but in many cases, they're still modeling. They're not accessing actual facility data. And that's why benchmarking is so important. Um, I'm currently doing a study funded by the gas utilities in California that's looking at um, energy efficiency measures for gas savings. And like all of these studies, it requires a survey and an interview phase. And I have to tell you, it is so hard to get lots of responses for these. And so, I'll just end this 
little spiel by saying like, please respond to those when people ask you because otherwise the industry is making up stuff that they hear from like four or five responders and then policies are made and programs are crafted based off of that feedback. So if you don't chime in when you're invited to, unfortunately, they'll make things without your input because there's not that much data to go off of, so. Yeah. yeah, and I'm not trying to counter you or even be devil's advocate here, but there have been times where I've been asked questions and I, I really do try to pay attention to what's going on in facilities that I've run, but I might not know the answer. Like I might genuinely not not know how much I water. I know that the runoff is probably between 10 and 15 percent, but I'm not truly capturing that. I'm running it through a recycling program and system where the accuracy is a guess at best and I worry should I share my best guess or should I cage it and not answer at all? Or, you know, I know other growers struggle with that too, where we want to be accurate, but seven days a week, hands in the dirt. It's almost like, man, this is more important that I just transplant these 500 plants today than it is that I go over here and try and get more granular data on X, Y, and Z. I know that's not a fair answer, but it's definitely something that uh, I feel, you know, yeah, you touched on something that's that the researchers are aware of and the benchmarking, you know, the people interpreting benchmarking reports are aware of too. It's about what is the quality of the data going in? Is this self-reported data that's, you know, Jesse says, or is it a system? Is it a utility? Is it, you know, a, a sensor reporting how much energy has been used, how much water has been used? And so having system reported data would be would be very nice, but that's expensive for everyone and not likely to happen across the board. So these industry averages that get created are an amalgamation of self-reported data from all these different sources that all have their sources of error. So we, we try to do the best with the data that's out there and we have to kind of acknowledge that, okay, well, Jesse didn't actually measure this, but he does know from experience. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's better than nothing. It's better than nothing. I agree. You got to start somewhere, right? And then we can challenge those guesses and hypotheses and build upon them and get to, you know, more granular accuracy. This episode is brought to you by ERI. ERI's team of engineers helps growers across the nation use less energy and harvest more flour. Whether you're designing a new facility or tuning existing operations, their engineers are industry experts on the most cost-effective ways to cut operating expenses from your electricity and gas bills. Let them be your energy management partner, helping you compete in the market while complying with energy regulations. Get started today by emailing Gretchen at eripacific.com to schedule an audit. I'm curious, like, is there any questions that you wanted to ask the Growbot? Is there anything jumping out to you or anything you want to try and stump it with? Or Yeah, I want to ask it, is it possible for an indoor cannabis cultivation operation to be net zero energy or, or net zero carbon, if you want to be even harder? Yeah. That's a great one. <laughs> Take that, robot. Good luck. <laughs> Can be challenging. I like that it's yeah, no <laughs> It's such an optimist, right? <laughs> you can throw money at anything if you'd like. <laughs> Start with energy efficiency. Yep. The least amount of energy consumed, you have less carbon to start with. It's bringing in renewable energy. Not surprised. I know this is probably, and I'm not trying to take it off topic because I want to explore these things, but I'm curious your take on greenhouse versus indoor. I mean, obviously we sell indoor racks for cultivation, but we also sell racks for curing and things Mm -hmm. that serve the greenhouse and outdoor space as well with augmented airflow. I know that the metrics are always like, hey, well, I can get five or six turns a year indoors and outside I might only get two or three. And that tends to be the reason why CFOs lean towards an indoor cultivation facility. But as someone who has their finger on the pulse of utilization relative to production, I'm curious your take. If you were going to build a facility tomorrow, would you build a greenhouse, a supplemental light greenhouse, light depth, open field outdoor? Um, just curious. This is a good question. And in the context of the one we just asked, because um, depending on the location, it might be easier to be a net zero carbon cannabis operation if you are a greenhouse than it would be if you are an indoor facility. So 
in certain regions, I might definitely go greenhouse because I can take advantage of natural sunlight. I would choose a location with moderate climate so that I'm not getting slammed with solar heat gain and I'm not getting frozen in the, in the nighttime or in the winter. And then I would choose a location which has pretty clean grid supplied electricity so that I don't have to buy an expensive renewable energy system. Um, and I would, I'd be efficient. So I love working with greenhouses. I think that they're uh, a very long standing industry that we really should like learn from as we continue to develop the indoor ag industry. Um, and I think that if I was going to build a facility right now, I think that the productivity that indoor facilities offer is definitely a reason why perhaps my investor would push me that way. However, getting productivity out of indoor facilities isn't just like a silver bullet. It's not magic. It doesn't just happen because you did it indoors. I think in some ways greenhouse might give folks a little bit of a uh, assisted by nature aspect. So you can uh, still, even if you aren't as productive as you would be in an indoor facility, your op, sorry, your mm -hmm. OPEX is not as, you know, big. So you can perhaps survive in a more lean situation as we're seeing in many markets, lots of businesses are, you know, contracting or, or leaving regions because of the cost of cannabis, wholesale price of cannabis going down. So I think that you can get less for greenhouse grown cannabis than you can for indoor. I'm not a finance person, but I think that if I was going to hedge my bets, I would do a, a greenhouse facility. Um, I think that in a location like Vermont or in Wyoming or places like that, I'm really enjoying the idea of like vertical greenhouses. Um, we see that in food a lot right now. Um, so that could be cool, but, uh, that's, you can take advantage of lots of this, you know, historical knowledge of greenhouse technology, but include vertical racks and start to potentially be, um, making more, uh, from that. I haven't seen a cannabis operation really do the vertical greenhouse thing, but I'm seeing it a lot in food. So I'm curious to see if it's something that might translate. Yeah, and I think oftentimes it's easy for us to <clears throat> sort of keep it at the base level and say, hey, we're growing high grade flour for sale. Like you'd mentioned, the price per pound of greenhouse maybe being less than indoor. We haven't even really unpacked the energy efficiency of consumer packaged goods, mm -hmm. transitioning through extraction to production to bottling to all these other ancillary attached businesses that mm -hmm. maybe increase the profitability and maybe the margins are 500% on nano emulsified drinks that you make out of your product. So yeah. maybe it's a greenhouse that creates consumer packaged goods that takes a little bit of a hit over here, but is super efficient over here that allows mm -hmm. them to reach the market 365 every day. Um, it, I think it's a balance, right? Everything is sort of a bigger business plan these days. It used to be, yeah. let's pop some seeds and grow some weed and sell it to our buddies. Yeah. And now you really got to think about all the different avenues and streams that play into it and balance them all against each other. That's something that Growbot didn't really talk about, which is like, it depends on the product you're making. It assumes that cannabis is the product. Well, <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. it's not all flour. You know, some folks grow genetics, some fro mm -hmm. some folks are growing for extract. Some folks have post-harvest processing on site and they're doing lots of things with that stuff. And so, um, yeah, maybe the, the quality of the product in the cultivation phase, there are different quality metrics that matter. And so, um, what the product, the end product is, is, is a very important aspect mm -hmm. that goes along with your efficiency journey, with your sustainability story, and also with how you make your KPIs. You know, yeah, I took it from you. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's good. That's perfect. That's exactly what I was thinking. It's like whenever I talk to someone about, you know, from a consulting perspective, it isn't more light or do more of this or subtract this. It, the first question is, what are your goals? What metrics and KPIs are you currently collecting that you think are really important to driving the financial or whatever success you deem successful in your business? And then let's unpack those and figure out how we can set up different triggers and influence those metrics and KPIs to drive your productivity rather than thinking you need more biomass or you need more active compounds per gram. Like maybe that's not the metric, right? What metrics important really helps us dictate where we should put uh, limited resources in order to get better? Yeah. Yeah. Like the last question we asked, probably it isn't most people's goal to run a net zero carbon cannabis mm -hmm. facility, but what is, what is your goal? Is it to reduce 
year over year compared to your first year, you know, improve year over year, you know, reduce energy consumption, improve yield? Or is it some line in the sand that you can define and you can track against every year? So I've seen some brands put out sustainability reports, um, but we haven't seen a lot of standardization of what is the goal of the cannabis industry um, when it says it wants to be sustainable. Yeah. What do you think, Will? Is there anything you want to ask or throw at the grow bot? I was going to ask this like convoluted question about like what would be the best state to grow in in a greenhouse environment that mm -hmm. would most closely achieve a net carb net uh, zero carbon footprint. Yeah, where yeah. would be the best place to put a greenhouse cannabis operation mm -hmm. to minimize carbon emissions? Energy. Yeah. Yeah. And it's going to be the place that gives you the lowest price per pound in the most competitive market. So as much as you achieve one goal, you lose another KPI. Yeah, <laughs> or achieve, yeah. Or it's a place that's not even legal yet. <laughs> to achieve the best, uh, the lowest carbon footprint, right? Oh uh, yeah, the, the lowest carbon emissions or the, yeah, the carbon lowest footprint if you want. Carbon. You guys can take this answer, but I'm running to St. Lucia and I'm going to build a greenhouse in the Caribbean because oh, I'm going to live on the beach really and nice. eat fresh food. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll make it work for me. Resource. Okay, fine. Climate. Just get oh, to it. Oh, it's not even going to give you a straight answer. It's though. not going it, to give us an it answer. It shows you the, the way it works. It's like it shows you the work, it shows you the reasoning, and then like hopefully it'll give us uh, some suggestions here. Because I'm talking about this with you know, both cannabis and non-cannabis growers is like site selection screening. Yes, I know I want to be in Tennessee, but I don't know where in Tennessee, right? Like, or I don't, I know I want to be near this city, but would it make sense to be here? Am I going to be with a good utility? Will, like, will I get a good rate? Um, so looking at, um, I don't see, I see, I see proximity to infrastructure. It doesn't, say utility rates i think that that would be an important aspect but okay. wouldn't necessarily contribute to it being environmentally important but it would okay, affect fine. okay fine. i like the proximity to resources too because i think about this all the time as i struggle do i buy local or do i buy organic what if the organic had to travel halfway across the country to get me should i just buy local is that better for the world mm -hmm. and Think about that in cannabis distribution too. What's the go-to-market strategy and what's the cost associated with that? Do I have to truck this all the way across the street, uh, across the state to get to dispensaries? Southern Spain. Southern Spain. <laughs> the Barcelona. Let's go there. I mean, I have been watching Wait, Central the German... California. All right, Fresno. <laughs> Win for Fresno. Put and it's a so well-developed region of re renewable energy. Um, water availability can be a problem. No joke. <laughs> Yeah, right, Western right. Netherlands. <laughs> that's, Long that's history a good of greenhouse about. agriculture, like we were talking about. These are only history examples. of cultivation. Like, what's the geographical history there, and what's been done, and what's already contaminated, and other problems yeah. you're going to have to overcome. Yeah. So this is pretty good. Reason. That was a fun. Southern exercise. Spain, Central California, and Western Netherlands. <laughs> there yeah, you know. they're they're emphasizing that it's got good renewable energy infrastructure, which can help offset your impact. So. Central California, like we were mentioning, suitable because it's got moderate climate, it's got good solar resource, and then also can um, take advantage of renewable energy. So water recapture and reuse will be very important. <laughs> this is awesome. fun. <laughs> I want you to ask it, like, give me more locations in the US. <laughs> right. Give me top five locations. Because I, I want to see some oddball ones, like, you know, somewhere in montana or like arkansas you know, arkansas yeah or arizona let's see central california right, central yes we got you <laughs> i already told you <laughs> one really like central. Did, you, did i say california already <laughs> yeah by the way go to california i it also doesn't mention though the market in california and cannabis yeah and some challenges yeah. in california so Southern oregon Oregon's. also a good location also a mature Georgia. market though yep Good water though, easy water. Mm -hmm. North Carolina, nice. Okay, there's your own Asheville, Asheville's full of hippies. We can make a growth yeah. there. <laughs> but I think Colorado. there's still a Delta Nine state, so I believe you're uh, still right. there. Colorado, Colorado again, mature market. Let's see. But it does, like I mentioned, have those utility programs. Arizona. All the Arizona. Okay. okay. The North Carolina one was Sun interesting. Country. 
the North Carolina one was interesting. And so they are, it seems to have good access to labor as well. If you're thinking about transportation, I, I wasn't even thinking about transportation impacts to emissions. So it's, it's all about where you draw the boundary. Yes. Well, hey, I think we're coming up on an hour, but uh, yeah, I don't want to keep you too long, Gretchen. This was a lot of fun. Really appreciate your willingness to take a deep dive into what really matters from an energy metrics and calculations concerns, diving into commissioning, retro commissioning, understanding the importance of sensors, granular data, what data reports are, and really looking for the opportunities to take advantage. Um, obviously, ERI is one of the best resources in the industry for allowing you to chase down incentives, understand rebates, and see what money's out there. But Gretchen, specifically, I think you're one of the best in the industry in helping people truly assess a facility and understanding what efficiency is, measure it with real metrics. And as we talked about, everyone has different metrics and KPIs. So make sure you know which ones are important to you bring those to the table, and then we can do some calculations together and really help make the most informed decisions as to how we allocate limited resources to build better facilities in the future or retrofit ones that already exist for more profitability and future proof. Yeah, this is a really holistic discussion. I hope that folks, whether they're in the state of designing, operating, or completely rehabbing and renovating a facility, they, they can find something that worked for them. So thanks for inviting me. I hope people reach out if they need help. Well, we'll tell them how to get a hold of you, Gretchen, and we appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thanks so much, Jesse. I had a really good time. Um, learned from the Growbot, too. So. <laughs>